Um, moving on to our next keynote, th this man almost needs no introduction because I've already given him several at previous Open West. Why? Because he is such a stand-up, wonderful member of our open source community. Um, to, to give him some of the same questions, I, I know we've already covered things like his first computer before, et cetera. Um, I, I was going to ask, well, there was one question I was going to ask the Lieutenant Governor, but I'd already seen what happens when a deer is in the headlights, so I didn't ask him why VI or Emacs, right? He just wouldn't get it. But, you know, Pete, of course, we can ask that question, and, and his, his comment was the politician's answer, actually. Well, but it's the actual answer. It's VI for short edits, Emacs for program. Yeah! <laughs> All right. But, but along those lines, we would love to welcome out also a, a wonderful member of our, uh, just talking about all the fiber optics in the state and talking about our participation in, in the resources and how we communicate, and someone who's really stepped up to try and, and represent the technological needs in the state and our rights. Uh, please welcome Pete Ashdown. Um, I want to correct Jace a little bit. I'm actually not Pete Ashdown. I'm his alternate dimension evil twin. Um, today we're going to start with something a little bit different. First I want you to go to this address. Um, for everyone who's got a device, does everyone have a device? And uh, download what you find there. It's, it's harmless. It's a PDF. <laughs> Let me see if I can pull up mirroring. Okay, so what we're going to do is these are actual law enforcement requests. And what we are also going to do is examine them, and you, whoever can tell me what is wrong with them, will win a t shirt. QR code again. Let me see if I can. So the QR, I realize it's obscured, but can you type? The, the, U, the URL is the same as the QR code, so. We've got a lot of lazy people in this room. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we good to go, or we go? <laughs> Set. All right. So, actually, that's too small. So, this is the first one. Uh, we have the State of Connecticut Superior Court, West Hartford Police Department, um, asking about somebody who got fraudulent bank charges. Uh, Komodo Group for 99, 95, uh, TCO for 1595, Skype for 18, and the IP address used to make the purchase was from X Mission. Who can tell me what's wrong with this request? Yes? Nope, there actually is, right here. Superior Court judge, yes? Can they make a request of Utah company when it's not a Utah court? You are correct, it is out of jurisdiction. I am not living in Connecticut, large or extra large? Gray or black? Gray or black, either one? All right. So next one. Uh, U.S. Department of Justice, criminal investigation, very serious. Uh, X mission, uh, all stored electronic communications and other files associated with the following IP address. Yes? No, it's, it's listed right there. It's a static address. 
What's, what was that? Not a valid idea. Yes! Large or extra large? <laughs> I received this same request three times, and I'd go back and I'd say, this isn't a valid IP address. And uh, finally, after a little bit more uh, sarcasm, they got their heads together and came back with the right address. Now, this is also an interesting story because when I saw this invalid IP address, I already knew what it referred to. The actual address is 166.70.207.2. Now, anyone uh, perform a reverse DNS lookup on that in this room? I can't give you a t-shirt, but I'll give you some recognition. It's Tor Relay. Yes, it's Tor Relay. In fact, the reverse DNS is this.is.a.tor.node. .xmission.com. <laughs> and if you go to the web page, it looks a little bit like, like this. Xmission protects privacy, and I'm having a little bit of scrolling problems here. But we are one of the few, if not only, internet service providers in the country that actually runs a Tor node. Um, it is an exit node, so everything comes out, but entrance is only allowed to our customers. And we don't keep any logs on it. <laughs> okay, here's, here's the third one. U.S. Department of Justice again. Federal search warrant issued March 10, 2014. Dear sir or madam. Special agent in charge. Go on down, down, down. Uh, I lo I've lo love this signature. Uh, Joan, J Joan G. Margolis, U.S. Magistrate Judge. Yes? You didn't accept it. Well, it's a trick question because this is actually a valid warrant. But I'm going to give it to you anyway because you were the one who raised your hand. <laughs> okay, so the last one here, one of my favorites. Utah Attorney General's Office. Special Agent Mick Spiker, an authorized law enforcement agency for Utah Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. IP address here, signature name Craig L. Bardo, Barlow, U Assistant Utah Attorney General. Administrative warrants, administrative subpoenas, not a warrant. Um, about four years ago, well, let me get into the pre presentation. I'll talk a little bit more about why, what happened with administrative subpoenas in Utah. <laughs> Oh, here we go again. It's not. No, I'm trying to turn off the mirroring. I am. There we go. Okay. So. Starting from the beginning, um, identity requests. Who do we get identity requests from and what are they? Usually we get uh, email requests for whose email and give us your customer details is related to this. Um, what IP address is tied to customer details. Um, we get them from attorneys. We get them from detectives. We get them from the attorney general, as you saw. We get them all from all sorts of law enforcement. We get them from the Department of Justice. And we get them from the FBI. Now, this is an important distinction on the FBI because I've never received one directly from the NSA. I don't think the NSA actually does them directly. I think they go through the FBI. We have received one, which was a FISA court warrant um, that I believe did come from the NSA, and it was a monitoring tap on a single IP address, single website, um, that we complied with. So. Over the breakdown is about 95% of these requests are warrantless. Um, the reason they're warrantless is 95% of the time, people respond to them anyway. They don't go through a lot of effort to examine what we just did in this room. Uh, they get a scary looking letter and they go, oh, I don't want to deal with this, I'll just respond. Now, some may say I'm protecting criminals, but I'm, I feel like I'm protecting individuals. 
But I also come from a background, uh, and we won't go too deep into this, where social engineering is something you could do with a scary looking letter. You could take any one of these letters, put your own information on it, have them respond to a P.O. box, and I think it would be an interesting experiment to try how many companies would actually respond to something like that when they don't make the phone call to check out that it's actually not a detective, that it's actually not a law enforcement agency, it's just somebody trying to get information out of your company. So 5% of the warrants are actually signed by the court and are legitimate warrants. 5% uh, of the requests. Um, since 1998, when the internet started to become uh, a, an issue to government and they were aware of it, uh, I've received about 130 of these. That's so, total? what's that? Total or just valid ones? About uh, uh, total, over the course of that much, much time. Before 1998, I hadn't received any. Um, <coughs> administrative subpoenas, which is the last subpoena I showed you. In 2010, the Attorney General's office decided they um, were going to too much effort to try and get uh, information out of internet service providers, and they wanted a Utah law that facilitated uh, their ability to request information. Um, administrative subpoenas traditionally had been used, uh, and, uh, and still are, between departments of government. So if um, the Attorney General needs information from the Utah Sheriff's Office, they have to do an administrative subpoena just to put it on record, and they get it back. It doesn't need to be signed by a judge, uh, because it's just all government. Um, so they thought, well, we'll just bring in ISPs into the fold. Um, so the U Utah Attorney General's Office came up with this idea. No judicial oversight, as you saw. It was just signed by the Assistant Attorney General. And originally, when they started drafting this law, it applied to all criminal activity. Um, there was some pushback from the legislature on that. And uh, they reduced it to child endangerment, which is uh, the grease and the wheels of any law up on the, on the hill. Um, so this passed in 2010, and I made a conscious decision. I fought it back then. I, I, I emailed all the senators and all the representatives and said, I don't want this to pass for the following reasons. It's not constitutional. And I went to a committee hearing meeting on this thing and uh, said the same thing. It's not constitutional. I was sitting right next to Gail Rizika, who was saying the same thing, and, and for a change, was actually on my side. Um, <laughs> And it still passed out of committee, and I, it, it was a really bizarre experience for me because one of the most conservative senators on the Hill called me at 10 o'clock that night and had a heart-to-heart -heart with me about how he felt his party was getting away from him. And I'm like, you know what I ran as. <laughs> but um, he, was, he was dismayed at the time that this bill had passed. Well, when the NSA thing started boiling over in Utah, um, I was asked to give a number of speeches about it. And one thing I started talking about was we have a, a, a violation of individual privacy right here in Utah, and it's called the Administrative Subpoena Law. And I didn't think anything would actually come of it, but it did. Um, people started talking about it on the Hill, and they are saying, you know, it really isn't constitutional. So Senator Madsen, who I respect a whole lot, and is, is anyone uh, in Senator Madsen's district? Good job. Thank you. <laughs> He wrote SBO, SB 46, and it's, it's a great bill if you go look at it, because what he did is he searched and replaced, um, he searched and replaced subpoena with court order, which essentially turned it into a warrant law. In order to get information out of an internet service provider, you have to serve them a proper warrant. Um, at the same time, Sean Ray's, after uh, Swallow left office, uh, Sean Ray said, we are not going to be serving these anymore. So, over the past four years, I had received about a dozen administrative subpoenas, and I sent every one of them back, and I said, this is not constitutional, and my attorney's like going, you know, this could cost you some money, but in every case, they didn't challenge it. And I, th thank you. <laughs> and I think it's, it's important to note that I'm not trying to protect predators. I'm trying to protect the individual. Now, if it's that important, if, it, if they are going after a child predator, get a damn warrant. The, the, the reason being is it's not, it's not hard. Um, do you remember when, I can't remember the senator such and such was uh, arrested for drunk driving and the news report said that they served him a warrant at the side of the road? 
There should be a judge on call 24 hours a day. And if I can provide 24 by 7 support, our judicial system should be able to provide, provide 24 by 7. <laughs> so thankfully, hopefully, administrative subpoenas are a thing of the past, a thing of, thing of the past in Utah. Now, in November of 2012, I had a very interesting experience. <laughs> X-Mission is part of uh, a group of data center uh, consortium, uh, is in a data center consortium in Utah. And the NSA invited us to come out and see their new facility. And it's a very impressive facility. Just about anything you spend a billion and a half dollars on is. Um, <laughs> so myself and, and two other guys from X-Mission went out and toured this thing. Um, they wouldn't let us take any pictures. Uh, they wouldn't let us uh, ask any relevant questions. Um, and I, I, admittedly, at that time, I had stars in my eyes. I was like, man, this is going to be the most incredible computing center ever. And I was asking questions like, can you guys really read erased hard drives? Or can you uh, crack any encryption? And you know, just kind of deer in the headlights style questions. Um, but then a week later, I went back and I saw a letter. This is pre-Edward Snowden that was written by William Binney. Now, people may think that Edward Snowden was the first whistleblower for the NSA. Actually, it goes back quite some time. Russell Tice goes back to the 60s. Uh, Mark Klein was the one who was working for AT&T and talked about the AT&T uh, NSA Intercept Center. Um, William Binney again. Uh, Thomas Andrew Drake. Thomas Tam. And finally, Edward Snowden. And all these men have come forward and said, what is happening inside the NSA is not constitutional, it's not legal, and it's dangerous. Um, and so I started thinking about, again, before Edward Snowden, about what was going on out there. And the thought occurred to me, you know, they are just building a big hard drive. They are taking as much information as they can and storing it. And really, this is what I call the Hoover Principle. And they justify their ability to take all that information, intercept all that information as much as they can off the internet, and store it by saying warrants aren't needed to collect everything if we aren't looking at it. <laughs> so they actually take as much as they can, they store it, and then they get a warrant later, and then they have an entire history that they can go through in relation to you. Um, the Attorney General's office and uh, the NSA have justified this through something called pen registers. And this, the history of pen registers is really quite comical. Uh, in 1979, there was a Supreme Court case called Smith versus Maryland. And this Supreme Court case was a, in relation to a crime of purse snatching, where the person had taken the information he found in the purse and started harassing his victim. And um, the, uh, the case, they went to the phone company to get his phone records. And they turned over his call records to the court without a warrant. And the argument was that they needed a warrant to get that. Well, Smith versus Maryland said, no, this is public information. He was dialing a number. It was handed to a business. And that information was out in the public at that point. Um, pen registers, the reason it's called pen registers is when uh, it was originally described in Morse's 1840 telegraph patent, this is true, that um, it would record with a pen the, destination, the origination and the destination on a piece of paper. And so pen registers is a term that has been used through telecommunications ever since. But the, the court found that there was no legitimate expectation of privacy when transmitting records to a business. So they have taken that and they have presumed that this applies to the internet. The original uh, attorney in the case said it was a routine robbery case. The circumstances are radically different today. There wasn't anything remotely like massive surveillance of citizens' phone calls or communications. To extend it to what we know now as massive, we know now as massive surveillance, in my personal view, is a bridge too far. It certainly wasn't contemplated by those involved in Smith. Um, so this was, a, a, I think, is a very weak justification for mass surveillance or wholesale monitoring. Um, so we know wholesale monitoring is going on because of Mark Klein's described AT&T intercept room, which probably still exists today. 
We know wholesale monitoring is going on because of the Verizon call records requests. They ask for all your call records. And um, we also know wholesale monitoring is going on because they ask for LavaBits SSL key. Now, this is an important thing, too, that I was thinking about last night that I didn't realize until I was writing this presentation. Heartbleed. There's a lot of speculation going around that the NSA has known about Heartbleed for years, yet they requested LavaBits SSL key. Um, if they had known about Heartbleed, they wouldn't need to request LavaBits SSL key. And I don't know how many of you know about the LavaBits story, but LavaBit was a, an encrypted email provider that shut down instead of handing over records to the government. Um, it's, a, it's a great case to watch because they finally did hand over an SSL key, but they printed it in a four-point font. <laughs> I, think, I think it would, might have been binary, too. So. And the wholesale monitoring is going on because I saw a little bit of it. I mean, they, when we got the Pfizer report request, they came in and put a box on our network. They said I couldn't talk about it, even though I'm talking about it today. Um, yeah. And they had ongoing monitoring of a specific website. And I wish I could tell you what that website was, because that is also comical. It has nothing to do with terrorists. It has nothing to do with... Uh, criminal activity, it has nothing to do with suspicion of criminal activity. It's a, a retail shop and it, what it's selling is so benign it would make you laugh. But they monitored their, that. The FBI called me and they said, we want to put this box in your network and I, you know, found out it was specific. And they monitored that um, for nine months. At six months I called them up and I said, when am I going to get this thing out of my network? And they're like, we don't know. And it just kept going on and then finally nine months later they came and collected it. So, what is the counter-argument for this? Uh, in the Fourth Amendment, my interpretation of the Fourth Amendment, is that customer data is entrusted to me as my papers and effects. That is, if you put your data on X mission, it becomes my papers and effects. And if you were considering when the Fourth Amendment was written, how valuable a customer list or a customer transaction list would be to the British for an American gunsmith those were his papers and effects, and that's what they were trying to protect. So I don't think it's any different for digital data. Um, also, probable cause cannot be executed against all my customers. You're not all guilty of something. So when they say, we're going to wholesale monitor everybody on your network, or we want the call records for everyone you've got, uh, they've got to show probable cause, and they can't. Warrants must be specific. Um, and I think courts should be public and auditable. The FISA court is currently not public and auditable. Um, it, is a, it is a secret court with secret, secret actions. And I do believe there is a place for secrecy and privacy, but not forever, especially when it comes to our court system. So what is the solution? This is the solution. Cryptography. Uh, NSA capabilities and myths, I mean, like I said, I don't think they can crack AES-256. I don't think they can even crack SSL-128. I think that they are uh, collecting all the encrypted data in the hopes that someday they'll be able to crack it. But uh, I think the curve is way ahead of them if encryption is done properly. Um, the, uh, it's important to note the economic damages that has happened as a result of the NSA scandal. Uh, the internet in the United States is no longer trusted worldwide, and people are moving their businesses that were formerly located here on the internet to other countries. Um, and uh, again, supporting my, my idea that the NSA isn't as powerful as we think they are, is that they had to demand that SSL key. And as Bruce Schneier said, the math is correct in encryption. It is implementations that may be flawed, as we saw with Heartbleed. And it's still our last best hope. I think there is one other stage here that's going to happen. Um, I have had the opportunity to do some free consulting for Salt Lake County on their IT systems. And uh, in, in doing that, I was, I was doing it with uh, Steve Corbato, who is uh, the um, CTO of the University of Utah. And um, the, the Salt Lake County people were saying, well, we should move to the cloud, right? We should go to the cloud. Everything should go on the cloud, right? And we're like, What's your motivation for going to the cloud? And I think it's really that they'd heard that's what you're supposed to do. 
<laughs> and Steve uh, mentioned to me that um, in the early days of computing, IBM used to run service registers, where you would send your punch cards off to be computed in the cloud. And that turned into home computing, and now it's going back. It's, in my opinion, it's the water cycle. So what is going to happen in regards to privacy is we're going to have clouds turning into puzzles. Puddles. Uh, robust IB, IPv6 will eliminate NAT. Thank God. <laughs> Everyone gets a big routable subnet that they can put all their devices on, all their light switches, everything in their house, and their servers. When you have increasing uh, bandwidth penetration, and we can talk a little bit about that after, um, servers will move to the home. So instead of coming to me for all your email, your email will be stuck at home. And I know there are people in this room that have their email at home. But we're talking about the general public. We're talking about grandma. Uh, we're talking about the people who don't know how to run a server. And that's what I want you to be thinking about, is how can we start moving in this direction. Uh, I think it is a much more tenable situation on a privacy front to not have somebody monitoring everything you're doing, not only for a government and law enforcement basis, but for a uh, commercial basis. The joke is, is that the reason people were outraged about the NSA is you didn't get a free browser and free email with them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if it's not obvious already, key up your own servers. Um, I argue that um, using something like Lux is a little too much of a clue. Um, I've actually, on some of my servers, set up a USB boot that keeps the key and everything, and, and the disk is purely encrypted. There's no indication that it isn't. Um, but overall, the question we have to ask ourselves, are we still the people? Is the surveillance state what we want? Do we trust government with this power? And we can continue to lobby our government to get this changed, um, I don't hold a lot of optimism in that area. I feel like it's more up to us to change it on the technical side. So that's the end of the presentation. But the point I wanted to make about bandwidth pre uh, penetration, and if you'll allow me to shift from the privacy angle a little bit, is uh, right now, um, how many people in this room are happy with their bandwidth options? In Provo. <laughs> Murray, we got some Utopia people. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, right now, Macquarie is an Australian infrastructure firm. <laughs> All right. Uh, who has come forward with a proposal for the Utopia cities. And what they have said is pay us a utility fee, 18 to $20. Uh, per household or business um, for 30 years a month, and we will build out and manage the fiber infrastructure completely, ubiquitously. Every household, every business will have fiber. Um, a, lot, a lot of city councils are struggling with this idea. Now, I think Google Fiber is a good short-term solution, but what I fear is the long-term. I fear that um, when I was before Google Fiber announced in Salt Lake City, I was in talks with Salt Lake City to run X Mission Fiber. Uh, the day Google announced, that changed. And there is no economic motivation for me to run fiber in Salt Lake City anymore. And 10 years down the road, when Google has become the provider of choice, there is nothing to say that when they have millions of customers and they feel a threat um, from a, another search engine, that they're not going to be pulling Comcast-style antics. The way you protect net neutrality is through competition. So, uh, in spite of what Spencer says, I think there is a role for government to play, and that's providing a level playing field for private industry to compete on. And that's what fiber infrastructure is all about. So if you're in one of those utopia cities, or even if you aren't, talk to your city councils, talk to your mayor, and tell them that you want fiber infrastructure. Um, how much time have I got left? Any? <laughs> can, I, can I take like two questions? Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you think you'll ever be providing uh, security on stores? I think I saw online that the throttle bit is, is going to be like changing some of the code. Um, yeah, I would love to. I've been looking, I've been watching MailPile. 
uh, very closely. Um, I would dedicate some of our own programmers to that task, but we've got some other uh, mountains to climb right now. Um, we do have, a, you know, I can go ahead and talk about this, is that uh, transactions between SMTP servers are usually not encrypted. Um, we do have an SMTP server set up, uh, securemail.xmission.com, if you set it as your return address. So if you have an Xmission email, you set that, your, uh, would be like user at xmission.com, you set it at user at securemail.xmission.com. Uh, it has to come in with SSL, it, it, it can't be intercepted. I think that's the biggest problem and, and the NSA's biggest boon is unencrypted at SMTP. Um, the problem I also have is uh, encrypted at rest. That's a big problem and we're trying to get our heads around that, um, but that is it, certainly on my list. One other question? Oh, yes. Technical security measures are what I, the warrant style security measures. Okay, well here's a good example. Is I, um, it was some time ago, but I had a, a guy call me on the phone. He said, you know, I'd like to buy um, your subscriber database so I can send them marketing. How much will it cost? And I said, uh, it's not for sale. And he said, come on, it's got to be for sale. You know, it's always for sale. How much is it going to cost per user to get me, your, get me your database? And I said, I'm sorry, sir, it's not for sale. Um, and he said, great, you just earned another customer. Um, we have a very strong policy on privacy. Um, we have had two instances, um, both related to passion, where employees have peered into somebody else's email and they've been fired on the spot. Um, there is only so much I can do to keep my employees in line and um, you know, having strong penalties for actions that w I don't agree with is, is the best I can do. Um, as far as the technical uh, security, um, I think one of the unique things about X-Mission is I'm still in the thick of it every day. I'm still managing the routers. I'm still managing the firewalls. I'm still managing the IP tables on everything. And I have uh, the sole vision as to how that works. And if somebody leaves, it still continues. Um, whereas in a much larger company, uh, you may not get that continuity and that, that uh, assuredness that I'm, I'm taking the, the, the black hat approach to security that uh, a lot of other company presidents don't have a clue about. So uh, I, I th I'm very proud of our security. I, like, anything I, like anything on the internet, it's not 100%. If you see a problem, please let me know first. Um, but <laughs> uh, I, try and, I try and do my best every single day. Um, that's it. Thank you so much.